from the tip of the uh, the blade to to the uh, the back of the handle. Everything's got to flow. Uh, everything's got to have the purpose. This is uh, one of the things that uh, I learned in uh, architect class is that uh, you don't waste space hmm. and everything has to have a purpose. And that is what I incorporated in all my knives from, from day one. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkies. Welcome to another episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Episode number 45 of the Knife Junkie Podcast, another interview show for you coming up today. We'll tell you about our guest in just a minute and what we have to look forward to. But first, we're going to talk a little bit about a, a Doug Ritter knife, uh, mm-hmm. some byproducts of the or byproduct of the uh, collection selection videos, if you will, and then a little bit of knife news with uh, Best Tech Knives. So, Bob, let's uh, start with the, with the Doug Ritter knife, a little story you want to tell about that? Well, yeah, uh, as um, you may have heard the couple of times uh, I spoke with Doug Ritter here on the show, we talked about his Ritter Griptilian, which is no longer being made by Benchmade, and uh, now his RSK-1 is made by Hogue. It's it's basically the same knife with some uh, enhancements. It had its first production run a while ago, and then you couldn't get your hands on one. It's a uh, KnifeWorks exclusive. They're an online purveyor. Well, they have it back, and by the time you hear this, it might be gone again, but I just happen to be... Uh, Uh, trolling around knife websites, as I'm known to do, and saw that this was back in stock. And it is basically the full-size RSK-1. It's like the Ritter uh, Griptilian, the same blade, uh, except now with 20 CV steel. It's got a beautiful and, and, and slightly differently shaped handle. It's contoured G10 with this amazing engraving in it. And, uh, I, I'm just really excited to have it. It's a really great work knife. I already de-vined a giant pine tree in our backyard, (laughs) and it just sliced through those vines like they weren't even there, and then it was good to go. So uh, this 20 CV steel is knockout. The blade geometry is incredible. Took it out into the rough and used it. (laughs) Yeah. I was like, well, Doug Ritter, you know, he's a survival guy, and this is what he would want me to do. So I took it back and thrashed on it, and it was like nothing. Uh, So amazing knife. Very happy to have it. Plus. There's there's a little uh, sentimental value to it now too. Okay, cool. I want to remind you about the Knife Junkies collection selection videos where uh, Bob is looking at uh, uh, all of his knives that he has, uh, documenting kind of if you will, and uh, you can find those on the Knife Junkies YouTube channel. Just go to the knifejunkie.com slash YouTube and you can find them all there. And be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel so you don't miss any of the videos. Also hit that little bell notification and you'll get a notification every time Bob drops a new video. But uh, interesting uh, little byproduct, if you will, of the collection selection videos you've been doing. Yeah. Um, on and off throughout my life, I've thought about the different ways we remember things. You know, you smell a smell that you haven't smelled since you were a little kid and it it shocks you into, uh, you know, memory. And uh, the same thing with music, you know, it Think about the music you listened to in high school and those memories flood back. Well, in going through my collection and making little videos about them and and telling stories about uh, how I got them, uh, some of them have some pretty interesting stories. And I just realized this is another way for me to remember things. It's (laughs) by knives. I've been collecting them for so long. I was uh, looking in the case, what am I going to do today? And I pulled out this old SOG Stingray. It's like an old tactical folding knife from 1991 summer 91 i got it when Mm. i was in boston and all these things flooded back so Mm -hmm. it's just kind of an interesting uh you know if you hold your knives long enough to uh to have a collection that goes back you can uh, access memories that you may have uh, thought were gone just by picking Mm -hmm. them up and kind of carrying them again right right so it's just been kind of cool for me great way to document those stories as you said kind of keep them alive keep the memories going and uh, remember the the fun part of why you got that knife or why you had that knife etc so yeah yeah pretty cool um before we get into uh our our interview today we also want to cover a little bit of knife news now we're not always going to be talking about the new products being dropped or new knives out or those kind of things but uh, kind of one that's near and dear to your heart uh, kind of the the small business guy you know the the you know starting in the in the back somewhere and kind of you know making a little business or something but Best Tech Knives uh, coming out with a new model this week from uh, Adam Purvis uh yeah Adam Purvis um uh, I've been following him on Instagram for a few years. Uh, firefighter uh, with a, with a side hustle making beautiful um, mokume and 
different kinds of titanium clips, um, making beautiful clips. And then he, uh, he crossed over into, uh, designing and making knives. And he had two very successful knives come out, uh, over the past couple of years called the Primordial and the Primordial Mark II, which I believe is a, a larger version. But then the, uh, the third one he just came out with, uh, through Best Tech Knives. And it's a, a, a um, a high value kind of uh, selection. Best Tech makes amazing knives. Uh, I, I've had a few and they're all within the ones I've had have been within the $50 range and they're outstanding. So, uh, yeah, very cool sort of Warncliffe blade. And, uh, it just looks like a, a great worker knife. Uh, mm-hmm. that's also handsome to have, you know, in your pocket. But uh, yeah, like you mentioned, I just like the fact that this is a guy who followed his passion step by step. I mean, I'm assuming I'd love to talk to him on the show. But, you know, followed his passion step by step and just by moving one foot in front of the other, mm-hmm. he's now, you know, accrued this portfolio of knives that he's had right. produced that people are excited about. Well, you know, a lot of uh, empires are built with the side hustle, as you said. You got to start somewhere. Mm-hmm. So uh, if you have that passion for, you know, making knives, designing knives or any other kind of thing, you know, why not uh, venture out and start doing it while you've got a job? Uh, that way you're not having to, uh, you know, risk everything, if you will. But, uh, you know, side hustles can become something, you know, the major hustle. So uh, I like those uh, kind of stories, too. Yeah. And it'll be a grind and it'll be hard, but not <laughs> as <laughs> <A grind>. <laughs> <laughs> not as hard as not doing what you want and still having life be hard. You know, it's yeah, not yeah. it's never easy. So you may right. as well uh, make it something you want to do. Right. Absolutely. Talking to myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> want to remind you, the Knife Checkie podcast is brought to you by the Get Upside app. It's a great way to get cash back for every gas purchase that you make for the motorcycle, the car, the truck, the uh, recreational vehicle, whatever you drive. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone whenever you need to get gas. You just search the area your area you are in for savings. Claim your discount, fill up the tank, then just take a picture of the receipt with your phone. That's it. You've got cash back into your account. So if you'd like to help support the show and save money on gas, Go to thenifejunkie.com slash save on gas, get the app and start saving. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Bob, another uh, great interview coming up this week. Who are you talking to? I'm speaking with Alan Alishowitz. He is a uh, elder statesman in the world of tactical folding knife design. I've been, uh, I've been keyed into his uh, work for quite some time. And, uh, it was great to speak with him. Uh, uh, he's, he's got a Marine recon slash fine arts background and i love that mm-hmm. contrast wow yeah absolutely. shows in his work too interesting uh interesting combination as you said yeah all right well without further ado let's get into it do you use terms like handle the blade ratio walk and talk hair pop and sharp or tank like then you are a dork and a knife junkie so alan thank you so much for coming on the show thanks for having me oh my pleasure so before we started rolling, we were talking about martial arts a bit and uh, Pekiti Tertia being a very direct form of Kali. And then you got to talking about sea lot. What were mm-hmm. you going to say about that? Uh, a friend of mine's working on some uh, some sea lot that uh, he got from uh, Professor Jack in uh, KL. And it's, it's his family system. And it is, from what I've seen, it's it's fantastic. I mean, I'm not a big sea lot fan, but that sea lot I could get down with. Um, it is v- I don't want to. Oh, okay. It's violent. It's straightforward, violent. Uh, no extra fluff. Um, mm-hmm. Just in out damage. Their 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 empty hand is phenomenal. Just absolutely phenomenal. It is more muy barong than anything else. It doesn't look anything like sea lot that you're used to seeing. It is uh, more uh, ancient Thai boxing, hmm. which is muy barong, um, which is awesome. That's what I like. Wait. Uh, so. What was your path to becoming a knife maker? We'll we'll get back to the martial arts in just a second. How did you start making and designing knives? Um, I have always been interested in edge weapons uh, for as far back as I can remember. Um, I think living in Asia, Southeast Asia, was kind of uh, the triggering uh, over there. You know, TV shows over over here we have the westerns. You know, over there there's kung fu movies and. Uh, I guess, uh, mythology movies that's wrapped around Kung Fu and martial arts. And when I lived in, uh, Maidan and in Taiwan and Singapore, uh, I was exposed to a lot of the martial arts. And so I was always interested in not just knives, but just anything with an edge or weapon, <laughs> anything with a weapon, you know? And so mm-hmm. I would make them out of wood 
and uh, whatever I could find. And when I lived in Thailand, uh, going to high school, I started seriously designing uh, knives because there's a village, um, a Utia, it's on the other side of the river. It used to be the old capital. It's a, it's a cutlery village and uh, you can go down Main Street and there's just stores and stores of, of uh, agriculture knives, uh, swords. Uh, in the back, there's sheds with guys forging in conditions that I would not, <laughs> I would not work in that condition, you know. And so I had my designs made there. And uh, when I graduated high school, I came back to the States and I had some of the custom knife makers around Dallas make some of my designs and, and they just weren't, they weren't getting the, um, I guess the, the feel that I was wanting mm -hmm. out of the knives, you know, the, the designs were there, the execution was fine. The balance wasn't there. The edge geometry wasn't there. Um, so I just started making knives on my own. So one thing I know Alan Elishowitz designs for is an artistic touch. To me, um, I look at them and they're like art weapons. They definitely are seem like purpose-driven tools, and that purpose being, you know, utility, but also uh, uh, weapon ability, if you will. Uh, but they all have an incredible artistic flourish. How how do you bring the arts and your love of martial arts and your love of knife making together? When I was in high school. Uh, I wanted to be an architect, a mechanical uh, drafter. And so I started on that path. And uh, the school in Bangkok had an excellent program for architect and mechanical drafters. Um, too bad the teacher just kind of turned me off the whole entire thing. But before that, uh, I was an artist, uh, painting, did a lot of painting. I was trained by a painter. So, you know, I, mean, I took lessons since uh, probably, I'd say maybe seven years old. And so being able to see forms and shapes and lines, uh, I already, I had, I was already developing that, you know, from the, uh, classical art background. Uh, I hold a, uh, a degree in fine arts and then taking the, the art side, seeing shapes and lines and, and the mechanical drafting, being able to, uh, precision draw out my ideas on paper and then just being around, um, a lot of, uh, I guess, martial art weapons, uh, knowing what I wanted, mm -hmm. uh, the, the knife to do or, or the edge tool to do. Um, it was, it was actually a mind process of, of going through the, uh, design stage. I would go, okay, what do I want to make? Okay. Is it a combat knife or a fighting knife? All right. Well, this time I'll make a combat knife. All right. What do I want this combat knife to do? Okay. What's the length? What's the blade shape? Uh, who's it for? And so from there, you start writing down all these criteria and then the shape starts coming out to what you want to start designing to do you know uh are you let's say martial arts do you do more pakal or sock sock or ice pick or hammer grip you yeah. know so the blade shapes and the, and the length will will dictate that as well so what would you say is a signature aspect of your style across the board no matter what the intended purpose of one of uh, your knives is what would you say a signature uh, that's always there mm. Hmm. That's a tough one. Um, probably flow, the flow of the design. You'll never see a breakup in the lines. Uh, it doesn't look interrupted, uh, from the, from the tip of the, uh, the blade to, to the, uh, the back of the handle. Everything's got to flow. Uh, everything's got to have the purpose. This is, uh, one of the things that, uh, I learned in, uh, architect class is that, uh, you don't waste space. And everything has to have a purpose. And that is what I incorporated in all my knives from, from day one. So I know you've uh, innovated some things in folding knives. And the, and the one thing I want to ask you about is the button lock detent that you developed, especially uh, when married with a flipper. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, I have a new Hogue. It's not a flipper, uh, but uh, it is a button lock. It's the EX03, and uh, I got it just by chance uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I, it, it it's barely left my pocket. And um, I'm I'm really impressed with the um, well. All of my plunge lock knives are automatic, so mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. my first uh, non-automatic, and and I'm really impressed by the action and and how freely the blade moves, but how crisply it it comes in and out. You know the detent. It, so what's what's going on there? I started making button locks. Oh God, fifteen, seventeen years ago. Um, 
really long time ago. I looked at the button lock and I was like, you know, everyone's using the button lock for basically cheap autos. And um, I saw more there. Uh, I saw a lock that was uh, safer than most other knives because you had to come across the the, uh, the handle to close it mm -hmm. and the blade would be uh, in the path of your thumb. Uh, it's intuitive. You look at the button, you push it. And it's. Um, I saw that it could be stronger. So back then, the button lock uh, was very small. It had a flange on uh, the top side. There was one company, uh, Speed Tech, that made a killer button lock. Uh, it was all machined out of one piece, uh, very well engineered. And I just I looked at that going, wow, that's that's phenomenal. Jim Jim O'Young did a great job engineering it, and it was uh, extremely strong. But I didn't want to go that route, you know. That was uh, I had to look at uh, also manufacturing, the the manufacturing ability of, of the button lock. When you say you didn't want to go that route, did you do you mean the integral handle route or what? No, route? The, the actual the way he made the button because the button oh. was um, most button locks is a post, which is a button with a with a center post with another button with a spring pocket in the back. He actually had everything machined off to one side and that acted as your stop pin in the closed position. Mm -hmm. The bearing surface was massive. It was a phenomenal design, um, but it was a lot of money to produce that button. You right, know? Right. And so I had to find out another way of, well, okay, how about how do we simplify the, uh, the button lock? Well, what I did was I blew it up, made it bigger, got rid of the flange because really there's no need for the flange, put a taper on the button, put a taper on the blade. Because back in the early days, basically the taper is only on the button. The blade was just a machine uh, crescent. And so I put a taper on the uh, blade and the button. So they, they both interlocked together. And uh, from there, I started making a lot of button locks. Uh, I incorporated the detent within the, um, the button itself. The button was the detent. Right. And so what it'll do, it'll fall into a shallow pocket with like a 45-degree chamfer. Okay, and the button would actually hold the blade in place. For a manual knife, it was okay. For a flipper, I found that it was just not not strong enough. It didn't have the pop, you know, like a liner lock. A liner to lock to send the blade all the way exactly, out. Exactly, okay. exactly. And so, um, about the same time, I came up with the idea of just using. You know what? I'm just going to use a separate detent. Hogue came up with the exact same thing. <laughs> And so what they did was they have a spring bar that's uh, adjustable, and which is really cool. It's way cooler than my idea. You know, my idea was very simple: cut cut a um, a diving board, basically it's a spring a spring bar uh, in the liner, and just put a ball detent in it and uh, machine the uh, hmm. the liner. What they have is they have screws that can control the tension of the spring bar. So if you want it looser, you want it tighter. You want it higher, you want it lower, you know, which is way cool. I mean, they got a patent yeah. on it. And and so I, I had to say, you know what? Yeah, why don't you use that one? Because that's way more flexible than mine, you know. But that's why, that's why the but, that button lock fires off the way it does. The detent is separate from the locking mechanism. Right, right. Yeah. On like the EX-05 flipper yeah. or, yeah, with that amazing look. Well, we'll get to that in a second. Let's talk about Hogue. As I mentioned, I got an EX03 recently. Uh, I was in a uh, local 511 uh, tactical store, which I'm shocked is there to begin with. I live in major suburbia, and I'm 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 afraid it's going to go away. And I walked in. I'm going to buy something today, and they said everything's on sale. I said knives too, which is rarely the case. And they said yes. Cool. And this, I ran right to the the Hogs. And uh, so these are your babies. I, I look at I look at this uh, EX03. And, uh, it's, it is the, the most, I would say, budget friendly of the line. It does not feel that at all. Uh, but I look at it and I see echoes of your, um, amazingly, um, artistic custom knives. So tell me a little bit about Hogue knives. What, what sets them apart aside from your, uh, leading their designs? Well, tell me a little bit about that, but also what sets them apart as a company? Family owned, um, the Hogue portion is owned by the Hogue family, and the Hogue tool and machined uh, portion is owned by Jim Bruins. And the uh, the machine portion is what spearheaded all the knives. Okay, so mm -hmm. it, was, it was actually Jim Bruins' idea to, to start making knives. 
you know, and I was introduced to the Hoags and, and Jim Bruins uh, about, I would say, 12 years ago um, by Jim O'Young, the founder of Speed Tech. Mm -hmm. It happened to be his birthday and we were all together. And uh, we just kind of hit it off. And it's a they're a great family, great bunch of guys. They're all, you know, they're all super talented, you know, in their field. Jim mm -hmm. Jim Bruins is uh, a trained uh, tool and die master. You know, he knows plastics. That's that's that that uh, EXO three that you got. That's mm -hmm. his that's his baby. That's his baby. Um, he he said, Alan, I want to make a a polymer version of the O one. I'm like, okay, but I want to make it in one piece. I'm like, uh, dude, you know that there's mechanisms inside there. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I know I can do it. Okay, whatever, you know, go for it. And sure enough, he did. Well, not for nothing, this polymer is amazing. I, yeah. And, and I've, I've never thought I'd say that, but like compared to the, the handle of a Delica, for instance. Yeah, or, it's not Zytel, it's tough. Oh, man, it, it feels yeah. like a rifle. It actually yeah. feels like the stock of a, of yeah. a, of a battle rifle. So they came to you, and you've been designing all of their knives. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah, right? We we uh, I've designed all their knives, uh, but some of the some of the H and K knives aren't my designs. Um, mm -hmm. We do everything in house in Paso in California, uh, so it, it's actually pretty amazing if you look at the pricing of of the knives and you look at the quality, and that's American made. Mm -hmm. You know, we have not outsourced uh, anything yet. Uh, I don't know if we will. Uh, they really like to control the quality and production of of almost everything that they're, they're making. You know, um, like I said, it's a great family. It's a great business. They make great products. They are honest to their word. You're obviously very heavily involved with this uh, amazing production knife company, which is, uh, I really admire how it's all being made in-house in the United States and in a state where you can't even probably carry this. <laughs> True. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Um, tell me about the custom work you do. I mean, I was, uh, I recently saw a, a design collaboration you did with Liang Ma and it was a Chris, it was like a folding flipper Chris that was just, uh, you know, this wavy bladed monster. Uh, it was beautiful. So tell me about, uh, your custom shop and your custom collaborations. Okay. My custom knives, uh, I do some mid techs, uh, and they are marked very differently from, from my custom knives. They look completely different to my custom knives. My custom knives, you could tell for uh, for the past, I think, 15 years, I was using a medallion. So mm -hmm. anything with a medallion in the in the blade or handle or somewhere around the knife is is handmade, and it is truly completely handmade. I'm there cutting the material on the bandsaw. I'm profiling. I'm grinding. I'm finishing it. I'm heat treating it. Everything is done in my shop. So it's that little inset golden dot. Mm -hmm. It'll be a golden dot or it's, or a sterling silver dot. Yeah. So that, that indicates 100% handmade. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. And if you see anything that had like, let's say a laser or a machine logo, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's a, a mid tech. Um, parts were made outside my shop. I will do the final detailing of the parts, fit up, sharpening, uh, any kind of corrections. I will do it in the shop mm -hmm. by myself. Yeah. So when it comes to, uh, collaborating with someone like Les George, who we had on this podcast mm -hmm. a while ago, for the Cerberus, right? That was the mm -hmm. knife you made with him. Yep. How does that work? Do you decide uh, who's going to design the handle? Who's, or, or do you both design the entire thing and then come to an amalgamation between the it, two? It depends. It uh, depends on, on which maker I'm working with. Uh, that particular knife, the knife was designed by both him and I. Mm -hmm. And then he did the machining. And then I did the detail work. Detail work is another, I would say, signature of the knives I see, especially the ones with the medallions, you know, the ones that you hand make. Yeah, like I, I would finish all the parts, you know. So he, he gave me all these, I, I hate to say raw parts, uh, basically they're raw parts. They're off the machine. I mean, right. they have tooling marks. Uh, sometimes some things need to be reground, uh, recorrected uh, because something kind of goes weird with machining. And uh, the fit up, the detent, uh, the sharpening, um, just the whole entire pack. I put everything together. Let's talk a little bit uh, about your design and production process. Do you draw things out by hand? Do you use CAD? What, what, how's that? I work? tried using CAD about 23, 23, 24 years ago. Um, I didn't get the feel of it. I, I, I couldn't feel what I was, what I was drawing. 
you know. Well, you're a fine artist by training. Yeah. Right. So, so I went back to, uh, to paper. And so what I do is I draw everything one to one on paper and, uh, I'll do all the math. I'll do all the, uh, engineering on it. Then at that stage, my, my drawings are very precise. Um, I would say if you were going to measure them, they were like plus or minus maybe seven thousandths. Wow. Like I'm very, very precise with my drawing. That comes from the architect mechanical drafting background. Right. Uh, I will spend hours, actually, uh, probably a week on one design. Okay. Then I take that design and I will blow it up two to one or 200%. Okay. From there, I redraw the whole entire knife, double the size. And that way I'm able to refine the design in a, in a larger pattern. And then I transfer that into uh, basically G10 patterns for my pentagraph. What's a, what's a pentagraph? I'm a pentagraph sorry. is a, um, it's a duplicating machine where you have a pattern on one side, you can trace it, and you have a cutter on the other side, it will cut whatever you're tracing. Okay, It's the old-fashioned milling machine, uh, CNC machine. Okay. Uh, at one time, machine shops used to have just rows and rows of these, and guys would just sit there and just trace over patterns and they're cutting out parts. So I use that to make my master template from a two, two to one ratio. And, uh, and then it, I use that also to transfer all the holes. And so everything, when I get that steel pattern completely done, it is basically half the size of that G10 pattern. And it's very, very precise. Are you a one man shop or do you have people? So then you, by hand, knock that out. So when it comes to, say, uh, uh, working with CRKT, which you have in the past, and ProTech and Benchmade and all those companies, you would just kind of make some of these super precise drawings and send them off to them or send a prototype? Send a prototype. I, um, I used to do just drawings, and then things got really messed up through the translation. And mm-hmm. then I went to, uh, okay, drawings and prototypes, so we are on the same page. And then I started, I did that with Hogue with one knife, the first knife, and I think the second knife also. And then after that, it's all been drawings because they are so good. They just, they, they copy almost exactly the drawings. Mm-hmm. But sometimes I will send them a prototype or a sample and say, look at this and, and you'll get ideas off of this. And they're like, ah, okay, fine. Yeah. So, uh, in terms of modern manufacturing, what, what do you think of these new processes these new machines and and high-end production from china what what is this done for the custom knife world and what is this done for just the knife world in general it's um it's opened up a lot of new doors you know uh but there's two let's talk about two different things the uh the chinese manufacturers like we and riat um man they're making phenomenal stuff i mean they're just they're killing it you know, they're just absolutely killing it. Uh, they're fit to finish the uh, the 3D machining. I think it was a uh, Wee Knives released uh, my friend Jim O'Young's knife uh, this year at Blade Show. Yes, yes. And wow, wow. It was, it's amazing. It's an amazing knife. You know, I mean, you just can't touch it. It's like 300 something dollars. You can't do it by hand. No way. I mean, if I was to make that knife, it would be, you know, at least $2,000. You know, that's a lot of machine time. And so... Because they've entered the marketplace, and here you could get yourself a a one piece titanium handle S thirty five VN blade with bearings, frame lock with inserts for two uh, for three hundred and like seventy five bucks. The mid tech market is crushed. Where do you go from there for a mid tech? You know, guys that are charging like six hundred dollars for a mid tech. Hmm. Yeah. So do you think the the mid tech um, movement or trend was uh, a stepping stone or a bridge from the old mode of production to the new mode of production? Uh, I think the mid tech was a stepping stone for some makers to go from handmade to now semi production and having the customers accept it. Okay, and so um, now we could talk like this. For a whole segment, you know, but at one point, you know, most, most makers made everything by hand. At one point, all makers made everything by hand. And then, so, um, if you got a bridge port in your shop, the whole knife industry just came unglued. Okay. And that's a manual mill. 
And then, um, then some makers started outsourcing. Bob Trizzullo was one. You know, he was one of the early guys that outsourced. I was one. You know, I was outsourcing way in the early 90s, mm. laser and water jet and wire, you know, and I got hammered pretty darn hard by, uh, by the knife uh, community. And um, I did that for a few years and I went the other way. You know, I went everything by, by hand. It had that sourness in it for some people that, oh, yeah, this is the uh, outsourced. There's some CFC in it. It's not 100% handmade. Mm. Uh, the mid tech allowed knife makers to get knives out to the public at a more affordable pricing. And over time, customers started accepting CNC made knives. As, as a consumer, it depends on what you're willing to pay for. You know, exactly. if, you, if you want a fully handmade knife, you better expect to shell out. But I mean, for 300 bucks for a mid tech, that's acceptable right, in many right. cases. Let's say, let's say you wanted knife maker XYZ's knife, but you know what? His average price is a thousand dollars and it's just not in your budget. Yeah. But then all of a sudden he comes out with this mid tech that's like 500 bucks. And it's got the same kind of style and flair, you know, it's got nice materials, but it doesn't have the high detail finish like his customs. Oh yeah. Okay. Now, now, now we're talking, you know, sure, sure. I'll step up and buy that. You know, and that's what, that's what the mid tech, uh, originally started as to help bridge the gap between pricing. And then it just kind of went off from there. Do you think now mid the mid tech market has uh, evolved or at least shifted into uh, makers just sending designs to OEMs and having them just fully produced there and not getting their hands on it and feeling confident? Well, if it's We Knife or or Riot, it's going to be a well produced thing. That would be more of a collaboration. Uh, I think the, okay. the let's say the, the, the mid tech market of let's say uh, five six years ago. I don't believe we'll ever see that again uh guys that were having 300 400 knives of one model being made mm -hmm. and people just buying them up like candy uh i don't believe we're gonna have that again uh i think the chinese with their phenomenal knives really has 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 kind of somewhat crushed that market you know uh what i'm seeing guys now doing is upping their their so-called mid-tech designs and pushing the envelope of machining uh, making it just phenomenal, you know, I mean, using CNC and, and, and handwork, uh, and you can see it in like Gus's work, you know, GTC's work mm -hmm. is, is a, a great example. Some of the Italians that, that uses the CNC, but then they'll spend like another, you know, 30 hours on, on, uh, finishing work. They're just making phenomenal stuff. So, uh, two, two important questions. Where, where do you see your knives going? Um, like what, what, do you want to accomplish in terms of design and engineering or innovation in uh, the upcoming years? More refinement, just more refinement, refinement and finish, refinement and machining, uh, refinement and design, everything refined. Uh, if you, if you look at my work over the years, it's just been a constant refinement and refinement and refinement. And, uh, and I find that, um, very true in, in a lot of the things that I've done or a lot of things that people do in the early years of knife making, I was just so eaten up on innovation, mm. just innovation. You know, what's new. I mean, I was, I was hungry, you know, I was just like, I had all these great ideas coming out. So it's innovation. And then over the years, I found the innovation kind of slowing down and then refinement. I wanted to refine it more. And it's like uh, uh, training in martial arts, uh, or uh, training in firearms or archery. At the very beginning, you just want to learn all the different techniques. Mm -hmm. But then over, like, you know, 20 years of doing this, what you're finding out is that you're going to the same techniques <laughs> over and over again. And because that's, that is the go-to techniques. Yeah. They work every single time. And what you're doing is you're refining it. You're refining the timing. You're refining the distance. You're finding the understanding of it. That's my goal is just refining the actual art of uh, knife making. So to me, nothing says uh, the raw exercise of refinement than making watches. What is yeah. this about you making watches? Um, mm, I had this dream of becoming a watchmaker. Um, 
I actually looked in at a watch school in Switzerland huh. about 22 years ago. I was going to basically drop everything, move to Switzerland and become a watchmaker. In my opinion, it's like the ultimate precision, the ultimate quest for uh, pre precision and, and refinement. Uh, they say that uh, it's perfect when you can't see it under a 10 power loop. Ah, yeah. And so the Swiss, uh, the Swiss watch industry is the epitome of, of, uh, precision, you know, in my opinion. And, uh, it was a challenge and that's why I started making watches. Uh, and pens too. You also make pens, the, the pens. Okay. So the pins and the watches was that, I mean, the pins, the pins and the rings was actually kind of funny. Um, yes, I did make watches. Uh, I'm sorry, rings and pins. That was the train me on my lathe. Mm. to make watches right okay you know because it was i didn't know a lot of lathe work so i needed a lot of turning time mm -hmm. so i was like okay let me start with pins and then let me do some rings and then let me get more complicated pins and then all right here we go i'm gonna try a watch you know bringing bringing it back to knives how important to you is uh, the aesthetic of a knife uh, versus or not versus but at what cost of the function i will never sacrifice the function never when a craftsman sacrifices function for aesthetics and looks, it's just going to be a bad product. What do you think of the abundance of new knife makers? About their work or of them? Not, or... not necessarily about their work or even necessarily them. There's some amazing work coming up. It's just, I guess I'm a little shocked. I've, I've, been, uh, I've been collecting knives my whole life and just been aware of things. Uh, and, and it seems like in the last five years... Uh, it, it, there's been an explosion, yes. an absolute explosion. And it makes me yes. feel like, why do not, why do I not have a knife line? I should have a knife. You're right. You're right. Uh, five years. Um, I would say that the knife industry on the custom knife or, or the knife manufacturing side has probably doubled, you know, uh, it exploded and uh, you have a lot of new knife makers. You know, I've, I've looked at their work. I've studied their work. There's some that that stand out. Uh, a guy named Patrick Doyle. He is freaking good. I know him personally. He drives himself crazy <laughs> over his knives. That's what you want as a collector. You want someone that's that's obsessive oh, over yes. what he's doing, and uh, because he's he's pouring his soul in there. Uh, a lot of the other ones, I, I hate to be negative. Um, I, I'm just not seeing it, you know. Um, and I'm on the other side of the table. I hear things that, that the customers don't hear and they just don't have the love for it. Hmm. They're, they're in for, they're in it for the money. Um, I might be shooting my foot, making some enemies, but you know, I've always been known to be one to talk the truth. Well, you know? yeah, I think in, in any pursuit, there's going to be a certain, um, section of, of any given population that's, of course, of course. um, on, on the other hand, there are easier ways to make money. Uh, this ability with CAD, the ability to mm -hmm. to design things and then send them off and have them made, is pretty pretty amazing. It is. I mean, you know, I know guys that um, don't even have CAD abilities, and mm -hmm. and so what they'll do is they have a design, and they'll get somebody to engineer it up, put in CAD, and they will shop it around and have it built. And presto, the guy's a knife maker. <laughs> he shows up to shows with knives. It's a wonderful world. So where do you see it all going? Where do you see the knife world headed in the next, mm. say, let's give it 10 years? Where do you see it going in 10 years? That's a hard question. I mean, you know, in the early days, I had a great crystal ball. I could see it. It was clear <laughs> as day. Mm. Now it's very murky. More CAD, mm -hmm. more CNC, you know, uh, just more and more, um, which is fine. You know, I have nothing against it. Uh, like I said, I was one of the earlier guys to, to use the uh, technology. Yeah. Um, I went back the other direction, uh, not to not to prove anything, but just I don't know. I just I, I prefer it. Um, what do I see? I don't know. I, I I that's one thing I cannot answer. I think there's a change in attitude. I think when you started. When you came on the scene, there was much more of a focus of pocket knives as weapons, tactical knives being a um, a self defense implement as well as a as as a thing of beauty, and I feel like that has changed a lot. There are there are also I mean there are all there will always be tactically marketed knives. I don't know if that's right, but you know what I mean. Yeah, 
But it seems like with the expanding community, there's been an expanding in the purpose of knives that are being made. There's there's such an emphasis on everyday carry, sort of small smaller size. I, I prefer a larger knife personally, but smaller size and maybe lighter duty. And uh, I think maybe it's headed in that direction even more. You know, um, if you go way back, okay, if you're an old school collector, you would see trends back in like uh, the 70s and 80s. Oh, no. It was like, okay, here we go. We have our buoy phase, okay? And then we have our tanto phase and our, our dagger phase and our art knife phase. Mm-hmm. And then the tanto phase is when I started sliding into the, uh, the cutlery industry. And then, and then the liner lock phase, okay, started. And it was all these colorful liner locks. And then in the early 90s, the tactical folders started trickling out, you know, and by about maybe the mid to late nineties, it was in full force. Mm -hmm. And so what a lot of people don't realize is that all these little phases of knives, like the dagger phase, the art phase, uh, the tanto phase, they came and went within like maybe a couple of years, a couple of few years. And then, then we're on to something else. The tactical knife uh, craze or movement and it had lasted for like 30 years. Mm-hmm. So can I see knives like going to a smaller EDC, uh, maybe a more um, modernized slip joint style where some of these guys are doing yeah. slip joint looking knives that are actually frame locks. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, tactical knives have taken a long ride for a long time, you know, so uh, I could see it maybe losing some of its momentum. Well, hopefully they never go anywhere because – they're my favorite kind of knives. <laughs> <laughs> Same mine. <laughs> Alan Elishowitz, I want to thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. I, I think there's a whole lot more we could talk about, so maybe sometime we'll get back together and, and talk some more. But I just want to say I, I love this uh, EX-03, and uh, I, I look forward to getting more of your knives. I got to say. Thanks for having me on. It was great. Appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Thanks a lot. Visit The Knife Junkie at thenifejunkie.com to catch all of our podcast episodes, videos, photos, and more. And we're back on The Knife Junkie podcast, episode number 45. And Bob, uh, interesting uh, interview there. And uh, just, I I guess, as we always do, kind of what hit you, what what stuck out, key takeaways. I I guess uh, I really um, resonate with his sort of artistic temperament. You know, he's a a person who's always been a fine artist, and uh, but he also found his inner... And I mean this in the best way, inner monster through martial arts and through the military. And so he's got a very well balanced, you know, he, he's in touch with his sensitive side through the arts and he's in touch with his, uh, masculine warrior side through his, uh, martial arts and his military background. And I, I just think it, it creates an amazing balance in his designs, yeah. his, uh, his knife designs. And not for nothing, his tomahawk design. He uh, in the in the weeks uh, since recording this uh, interview, Alan sent me a uh, one of the tomahawks he's having made with Hogue. It's called the uh, Hogue EX T01, and it's a 13 inch tomahawk that feels like a knife in your hand. It's balanced amazingly, and I, I'll make a video about it. I'll talk about it, but it's an incredible innovation. Not only uh, the design of the thing. And, and how it feels when you're, when you're using it, but also how it mounts to your body when you're not using it. It's pretty amazing. So anyway, mm-hmm. you've got the, uh, you got the innovative artistic spirit. And then you also have the, the knowledgeable know-how side that knows how to actually use those tools. And I think it comes together in a, in a nice balance. Well, that's going to wrap it up for this edition of the Knife Junkie podcast. We want to thank you for listening. Uh, please remember to uh, subscribe on your favorite podcast player app, whatever that might be, and uh, that way you can catch every week's episode of the Knife Junkie podcast. For Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim Person. I want to say thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.